I'm Libby Bainey. I'm Executive Director of the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies and Principal at Bakery, Baker Daniels Consulting. And I want to welcome you and thank you for coming today to talk about drug safety and supply chain security. So on behalf of the Alliance and Pew Charitable Trust, I'll give a little bit of an opening about who we are, and then I'll introduce the panel and let you hear from the experts. So the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies is a nonprofit organization founded in 2009 dedicated to making the internet safer for patients. We do that through a lot of different ways, as you can see. We do education directly with healthcare providers, and academic organizations, um, and pharmacist or pharmacy and pharmacist organizations as well. We try to influence policymakers and non-governmental organizations. We work with um, third-party intermediaries, internet commerce companies, and others to help make the internet safer for patients globally. We conduct research, whether it's our own research or sponsored peer-reviewed journal research, to try to inform the, the evidence base about counterfeit medicines and the dangers of illegal online drug sellers to patients worldwide. We also collaborate with many of the colleagues here, as well as folks globally, to help make sure that patients, whether they buy online or offline, have access to safe, safe medicines. Our hope is that by working together in a, through, non, through the nonprofit organization and with our partners, that patients will be able to trust that the medicines they take are safe and effective. Our members include the, num the following types of organizations. These are our US um, focused members. We have operations in Europe. We do work in Asia, India, Canada, um, and across the APEC region as well. And so our members, these are our US members. As you can see, it's a very diverse membership, including folks from academia, nonprofit organizations, industry, pharmacists, um, some, some consumer groups. We try to bring everybody that cares about patient safety on the internet together globally. We have a really great panel for today's conversation, and it's one that we put in context of the continual debate about healthcare in the United States. And the, the question that I think is on all of our minds is how do patients access medicines at a time of the, the convenience of the internet is at our fingertips, where the cost of medicines you know, continue to change and in many cases continue to rise, and where coverage for medicines continues to change. And all those things, the confluence of the seas, coverage, cost, and convenience, bring us to the question of what does the internet have to do with it, and what does supply chain security more generally have to do with, the, have to do with patient safety? And so we hope to inform the, the, the dialogue today by bringing in key experts from across the country to share their perspectives on the issue. You'll be hearing from a patient, who I'll introduce in a moment. You'll be hearing from a pharmacist and a professor at Purdue College of Pharmacy, Center for Medication Safety Advancement. Um, John, John um, Horton, who is CEO of LegitScript, and Elizabeth Youngman from Pew. Um, through today's discussion, we'll hope the, that if you have questions, we'll save some time for questions at the end so we can have a good discussion and hopefully answer any questions you might have. So with that, I'm, I'm really honored to turn it over to Ali Schreyer, um, uh, LCSW out of Denver, Colorado, and who happens to also be my sister. And the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this issue is medication safety affects everybody, including your loved ones. And Allie will tell her story that inspires all of us to make sure that the medicines you're taking, whether online or offline, are safe. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. Like Libby said, my name is Allie Schreyer, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And so I currently work in mental health. But um, when the incident happened, it was actually a couple of years ago, and I had just kind of gotten my first grown-up job as a elementary school teacher at the time, um, which meant that my insurance changed and that my doctor also had to change. So the go-to medicine that I had been taking, Allegra, which was my allergy medicine, um, was no longer going to be covered by my new insurance. And my new doctor had said, you know, oh, don't worry about it. You should use CanadaPharmacy.com. I send a ton of people there. It's great. All you need is a prescription from me, and it's no big deal. I mean, a lot of patients have a lot of luck. So here's the prescription, and just go use that site. So I did what my doctor told me to do. I'm 20-something years old, and I trusted my healthcare professional and went ahead and logged on to CanadaPharmacy.com and ordered my Allegra, my allergy medicine. Um, you know, I, since I had just started this new teaching job, initially I started to get some side effects, but I didn't know they were side effects because I thought, well, maybe I'm just really stressed with work and I, I'm starting a new position and maybe it's just this. But um, as the weeks went on and even the months went on, I had tons of different diagnostic tests done. I was seeing specialists in the Denver area. I had headaches all the time. I had stomach pains and got diagnosed with IBS, which actually then put me on medication. 
Um, I tried, or I was having back pains. I felt foggy. I just couldn't seem to hold on to a thought in my head. I overall just really my health was declining and I could not pinpoint what it could be. Part of the challenge for that was because I had been taking Allegra for years, right? So how could I be taking Allegra and still be taking Allegra? It's the only medication I was taking and suddenly all these symptoms came up. So that's why the doctors kept running all these diagnostic, diagnostic tests. I had a colonoscopy in my 20s trying to figure out what was going on and because they, it couldn't be medicine that I was already taking that medicine. Um, so after months of this, going on about six months, finally I, I, the doctors looked at me and said, we don't know what to tell you, we're coming up blank. Um, which was concerning on another front thinking, could this be something worse? What other illnesses are we starting to look at here? And around the same time, Christmas was just around the corner and Libby was actually coming home for um, Christmas to Colorado. And she came home and was casually talking about work and said, something, and I said, oh, that reminds me, I need to order my medicine online. And if looks could kill, right? I mean, she's, she does this for a living, and she said, don't you know what I do? And I said, no, you do health care something, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, obviously that wasn't my field. And so as she said that, she spoke up and started to say, like, Ali, I am vehemently against you using online medications. You don't know what you're taking. And I said, yes, I do. My doctor sent me there. I had a prescription. You don't seem to get it. Like, you're, you know, it's just, that's you. And she said, no, you don't seem to get it. And so she was able to use her resources and kind of her database and the things that she had access to that many people don't and looked into and said, not only is this site rogue, this Canadian site is also probably harmful. So you need to stop taking the medicine immediately. Um, so I did stop taking the medication. And within almost overnight, honestly, my headaches went away. Um, within about a week or two, all of my symptoms went away. This, I, I stopped taking the IBS medicine. My back aches went away. My, there was clarity again when I was thinking. I was really back to myself. And I could not even fathom that this had happened. So I went and called my um, new primary care physician who had recommended that I go there and left two messages with his office, didn't get a call back, went ahead and made an appointment, paid the copay, went in, sat down with him and explained, bringing the research and the literature, explaining, do you not know where you sent me? You sent me to this you know, rogue Canadian site and it made me really sick. And to say that he was dismissive would be um, an understatement. He not only was um, a little bit argumentative, he also did not even want to take the research and the literature that I had printed for him. And um, that, that kind of settled it, of him saying, you're wrong, this is a Canadian site with Canadian medicine, it's fine, I send lots of people there, I don't know what to tell you. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you other than you're no longer my doctor. <laughs> Um, so I left feeling incredibly frustrated, and I still am frustrated by it. Um, I'm, I was frustrated because I felt that he broke his oath to do no harm. I was frustrated because I really felt that he was um, you know, just so dismissive about learning new information, which was really concerning. And I also felt frustrated because I had doubted myself in the process and had been so sick that I was missing work at a new job and I had all these life complications from this that couldn't be solved um, other than just this medication that my doctor had given me. So really since that point, um, I've teamed with Libby and tried to become an advocate for this and understanding, you know, th we don't know where our medicines are coming from when they're not regulated. Um, and that it just is really concerning. And, and if it, I was duped, right, as a, I would consider myself a fairly educated person with a master's degree and that we come from a family of healthcare professionals, if I was duped, what's to say that any of you or your families aren't gonna be duped? And it's just really concerning. So, thanks. Thanks for speaking to us, Allie. You know, you put into context the issue of prescription drug importation in a really personal way, and so I'm really glad you could join us because I think we all wanna believe that there are safe Canadian sites, right? We can, we can just find them. Either we're smart enough to figure it out ourselves or they'll sell you the real stuff, 
Right? Not every site could be selling you bad stuff. And you're going to hear from more experts to talk about the scope of the problem. Allie's not alone in her story. Um, so we want to hear about the, st the, the scope of the internet pharmacy problem, the, the really fake stuff. There are fake websites that will slap a maple leaf on them, but they're actually based in a foreign country, have nothing to do with Canada. And then there's the licensed Canadian pharmacies that are actually not selling U.S. consumers, consistent, consistently selling U.S. consumers Health Canada approved products. Both of those are problems. And so the next two speakers are going to talk more about those two problems. The general problem of illegal online pharmacies and the danger to Americans. And the more specific problem of Canadian internet pharmacies, licensed Canadian pharmacies, that don't consistently sell Health Canada approved medicines to Americans. Those two things, um, I think, will continue to um, underscore the importance of Ali's story and the importance of the story for all of us as Americans in a time when Congress is considering authorizing opening up the U.S. drug supply chain to foreign source medicine from unknown suppliers. In that case, I'm pleased to introduce John, John Hertig, um, a, a board member and a member of um, the faculty at Purdue College of Pharmacy Center for Medication Safety Advancement. John. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I like standing. I get a little passionate about it, and so I'll move around. And I don't want to knock uh, either of my colleagues in the head. Um, I am John Hertig. Um, I am with the uh, Purdue University College of Pharmacy Center for Medication Advancement. We just call it CMSA because it's another acronym for you all to learn. Um, I'm a pharmacist by training, um, and it's really my pleasure to be here because this is an issue as a medication safety expert that I'm very passionate about. And to kind of frame the, the next 10 to 15 minutes, I want to use an iceberg as a little bit of perspective. You just heard from Ali, a really compelling patient story. And, and we see these time and time again, but they only represent a very small subsection of what's actually out there. They're the tip of the iceberg. In med safety, they're the people that actually get harmed that we see or that we read about. But for every alley, there's 10 other people underneath the surface that we don't see that are harmed every single day around the world. And there's a really big operation out there harming them. There are next to uh, close to 30,000 to 35,000 active online pharmacies at any given time globally, uh, with 600 new illegal sites opening every single month. It's a whack-a-mole. Every time we shut one down, 10 more arise, and we're always chasing our tail. 89% of online illegal pharmacies do not require a valid prescription. Not shocking, right? Our illegal pharmacies are not requiring prescriptions. And nearly 95% of providers, like me, I'm a pharmacist by training, and the physician colleagues and the nursing colleagues and the other colleagues that I work with have little to no knowledge about how to identify and counsel patients on safely um, going on to the internet. We are not trained to effectively do that, and I have some data to back that up. When we look at these illegal online pharmacies, um, some of the common... Uh, violations that are occurring, they're selling falsified, adulterated, unapproved medicines. There are some images that will come up here where these are back alley operations. I can't even call it manufacturing because they're the farthest thing that you can, can get from good manufacturing practices. Selling prescription medications without a prescription, without a pharmacy license, clearly if they're doing something illegal, they're not going to abide by some of our regulations. Because of the quality issues inherent in this type of operation, there's over and under dosing. So even if you do get the right active ingredient, you might get too much of it or not enough. Well, that could be really, really bad from a med safety perspective. If you get too much of an opioid or not enough of an anti-infective. Um, there's also interactions, adverse effects, and then financial fraud. We often don't talk about financial fraud. I, I talk about the clinical side, but realize that these are patients, these are US consumers, giving their credit card information out to criminals. So when you talk about financial fraud, when you talk about um, identity theft, that's a real, real risk to our patients. Online drug sellers make between a million and two and a half million dollars in sales each month. Each month. Huge, huge business. So there's a huge incentive for these, these folks to go on and start up these pharmacy websites. And if we create a bigger market for them, if we, we encourage U.S. consumers to go online, trust me, they will come and um, they will make their money. Here's some images. Again, these are prescription medications that are coming through Canada but really being made in Pakistan, India, China. This is exactly what the operations look like. Again, a far cry for our, our GMP facilities. These are some of the, the hidden poisons or materials that are found in a lot of counterfeit medications. You may have seen a graphic like this. We have heavy metals, common household items, uh, no drugs at all, drugs you didn't ask for, um, and then actual poison. One of my favorites on this list is antifreeze. And you may not know this, but antifreeze is sweet. Don't ask me how I know that. Okay. <laughs> But a lot of illegal um, online pharmacies and, and counterfeiters will use antifreeze to cut other drugs to make it more palatable for patients. 
not realizing that you're getting poison and it could be deadly. So it's a global issue, but, but here really we're focusing on Canada. And there are a lot of risks associated with these pharmacies in Canada. 95% of the products that are advertised on these Canadian pharmacy websites are non-USDA, US FDA approved. That means only 5% of the drugs coming out of here are US FDA approved. There's no way for us as healthcare professionals or consumers to know the conditions within which these med medications were manufactured, stored, or shipped. A lot of medications require very stringent shipping and storage uh, considerations, and we have no idea when it's coming out of an alley in Pakistan whether it was stored correctly. Uh, and there's representatives from the uh, US FDA um, that have reinforced that fact. So ultimately, if we take a step back and look at this entire market, uh, it's worth about 200 billion a year, um, which now eclipses almost everything else in the underground economy, including prostitution, human trafficking, and illegal arms sales. I just said a million to two and a half million a month this is big, big, big business, and it impacts people. We heard from Ali. There are stories just like Ali all over the world. Here are a few examples. Um, they target vulnerable populations, people that can't access medications for one reason or another, who can't afford medications for one reason or another, and they go online and they end up getting hurt. A uh, number of sad stories. Again, look back to the iceberg. This is only the tip of that iceberg, and there's a huge underbelly here. And the issue is, is that a lot of our patient protections are bypassed online. Um, I'm a med safety guy, this is what I do globally, and I'm very proud of the supply chain we have in this country because we have a lot of checks and balances to keep our patients safe. So if we look at the graphic up here, we have our physicians, right? They prescribe, they monitor, they make sure that our patients are getting what they need. You have the pharmacists there in the middle, right, that are also monitoring, they're double checking the physician's work, they're making sure they counsel the patient appropriately, and they look for abuse, and they look for abuse potential. And then we have our regulators at the state level regulating health professions, but then also at the federal level with the FDA having oversight of drug manufacturers as well as preventing counterfeit and substandard medications. Our own US FDA has made some statements to the effect that we cannot guarantee the legitimacy of medications that come from outside of the US. And they're right, they can't. And so by ordering online, you bypass all of these protections that we've worked so hard to institute in this country. And now you don't have any of that going on. You have direct ship from anywhere in the world to your door, whatever you want. And one of the things that people want are opioids. So in my, uh, my state, the great state of Indiana, we have an opioid issue. And I know a lot of the other states feel the exact same way. Well, now we have a situation where you can go online to about 12% of those illegal online pharmacies, about 3,400 options, and go buy Percocet, fentanyl, or whatever you want without a prescription, direct ship to your door. 91% of first page search results take consumers to illegal pharmacy websites, and we have an example up here. Obviously, the strength and purity is gonna vary because we just demonstrated the fact there's no quality here and there's no consistency. And US consumers are consistently targeted specifically for these types of sales, where they know that we wanna buy them, they will go after us just like any other marketing campaign and sell opioids online. If you go into Google today and you type in Canadian online pharmacy and Percocet, this is what will show up. Of these seven results, four don't re require prescription. They say it right there, no prescription needed. Uh, and then two of them even say that they're foreign, uh, but they're discreet, and they'll ship from anywhere in the world to your door. No questions asked. No questions asked. So when I think about the opioid epidemic going on in my state, this concerns me greatly from a safety perspective. Let's, um, let's pop open one of these sites. Um, one of my favorites is actually Legal Online Pharmacy. So, newsflash, if you have to say you're a legal online pharmacy, chances are you're not a legal online pharmacy. And this is one where we look at Percocet. And another giveaway, this is 10% extra pills, right? This is not a bag of chips. This is Percocet. This is an opioid. And the more you buy, the bigger your discount. Again, you go on the site, you give your credit card information to a criminal, and you get Percocet drop shipped to your door from anywhere in the world. You don't know where this Percocet came from. You don't even know if it's actually Percocet because it could have been mixed in a back alley in Pakistan. Now fortunately we have great people like uh, John Horton and his team and he'll talk a little bit more, um, but they're monitoring a lot of these sites for us. But it is whack-a-mole. For every great job that they do, 10 others can come up right behind them. And we're always chasing our tail and I know we'll have more information on that after my presentation. So you're probably asking, okay, you know, patients obviously struggle with this, our US consumers struggle with this, but I'm sure our doctors and our pharmacists and others can help them, right? Not exactly, not exactly. And some of the research that we did backs that up where health professionals themselves are unable to determine the legitimacy of some of these sites. 
What we did is we at Purdue partnered with um, LegitScript, and the purpose of the study was to determine the gaps in knowledge between pharmacists like myself and the illegal internet drug market. And we, we did a little bit of survey research. One of the first questions that we asked was prior to today, were you aware of the existence of illegal internet pharmacies? And the vast majority of our respondents are. They know that illegal pharmacies exist. They know that they're out there and they know they're risky. But 93% believe that that illegal internet pharmacy market makes up less than 80% of all internet pharmacies, which is grossly underestimating the scope of this problem because really it's 96 to 97% of internet pharmacies are illegal. And so even though our pharmacists know that they're a problem, they don't realize how big a problem it is. The next part of this survey we wanted to do is actually give websites to pharmacists and say, do you think this is legal, illegal, or are you unsure? So if it's your responsibility as a frontline health professional to counsel your patients, you need to probably know whether something's legitimate or not. So this is an example of Blink Health, and this is in fact legal. Our pharmacists got this right for the, well, 44% of them got it right, but over half of them either thought that it was illegal or they were unsure. This is information that they're gonna pass on to our patients and our consumers. So if we take a look at this website, this is Drugs Order, this one is illegal. Our pharmacists did much better at 71%, identified this as illegal, but still a quarter were either unsure or got this one wrong. And then this third website, which is very germane to what we're talking about today, is CanadaDrugs.com. We asked our pharmacists what they thought. This is illegal, and only 29% of our pharmacists identified this as illegal. That means upwards of 70% had no idea as to the legitimacy of this particular website. And this is information, again, we're passing right along to consumers. So if our pharmacists don't know, and our physicians don't know, how can we protect our patients? Uh, we did write a white paper on this, and I'm happy to share that. One of the questions I do want to point out from that paper is we asked pharmacists about their confidence to counsel patients. So if you have to counsel patients on the legitimacy of an of a online pharmacy, how confident are you? And only 34% of our pharmacists are confident. We are not armed with the skills. We do not have the ability to help patients stay safe online. So from the results from this study, uh, suggest that licensed pharmacists, like myself, are aware of the risks, so we know it's risky, we know the potential for doing harm is out there, but we are unable to determine the legitimacy of these sites today. Some key takeaways that I want to leave with you, um, thousands of websites claim to sell Health Canada approved medicines, but none do consistently to US consumers, and if they get it right one time, chances are they'll hook you by doing uh, and selling you a legitimate prescription first, and then they'll sell you counterfeit later. U.S. consumers and healthcare providers can't tell the difference like I just showed you. We, we lean on our, our med use process. We lean on our physicians. We lean on our pharmacists to help patients make good choices, and it looks like right now we can't do that. And so there's no way to ensure the products sold by foreign sellers are safe and effective. And for me personally, you know, as a patient safety advocate and expert, patient safety is fundamental to healthcare, right? You go in thinking you're going to get better, not worse. But drug importation and, and going down this road makes my job and the job of health professionals uh, increasingly difficult. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Libby, and I'm happy to answer questions, I think, at the conclusion of the briefing. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. So we have another John after John number one. Uh, John Horton, CEO of LegitScript, will talk to us about the problem of the licensed Canadian online pharmacies vis-a-vis -vis U.S. consumers. So John Herty gave you the big picture on illegal online pharmacies and importation generally. And we know that Congress doesn't intend to send consumers to illegal sites, right? That would be silly. So what we really want to do is send consumers to safe foreign sites. And the big question is, are there safe foreign sites that U.S. consumers can consistently get safe Health Canada approved medicine from? And you'll hear from John and the evidence that he can provide showing the answer is no. Thanks, I'm gonna stand up as well. My name is John Horton, and um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit, not only about the internet pharmacy market as a whole, um, but I'm gonna focus a little bit on the, uh, the so-called legitimate uh, Canadian internet pharmacy market. And as part of that, I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, some information from some confidential informants we have within that industry for the first time. Let me tell you a little bit about LegitScript. Um, we're a company of about 80 people in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're the, we have the largest list of internet pharmacies that's out there. We work with both the public sector, uh, FDA, DEA, DOJ, some of their counterparts in other countries. Work with Google, Bing, Amazon, Visa, 
Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, a lot of different platforms need to make sure that if they're allowing internet pharmacies to use their, their paid services, that they're legitimate internet pharmacies. As a result of this, we have a, a lot of data um, about internet pharmacies, and uh, we actually do a little bit over 100 uh, purchases from various internet pharmacies, mostly illegal ones, um, around the world every month. So we have a lot of data um, about not only the internet pharmacy websites, but where the drugs are coming from and how that supply chain works. And I want to share with you how this market really works. So just a little bit of top line data. First of all, this number changes, but roughly 40,000 internet pharmacy websites online at any one time. The US is the largest target market in part because we have some of the highest drug prices on average. So obviously the rogue internet pharmacy uh, operators are, are targeting the US, but not only the US. But about 90% of websites are in English because they're targeting here. 97% of internet pharmacy websites operate illegally. Um, now these 40,000 or so websites, most of them boil down to about 125 to 150 uh, networks. In other words, some of them operate five websites, some of them operate 50, some of them op operate 5,000, but most of the websites are connected to other websites in some way. Now, as to the Canadian internet pharmacy market, and you'll see that I have this in quotes, the, most of the drug importation bills that have been out there uh, currently and in the past uh, would sort of result in these being potentially uh, viewed as legitimate under uh, the new legislation. So I'm going to focus a little bit on about 65 to 70 uh, internet pharmacies that have a Canadian pharmacy license. You can actually walk into a brick and mortar pharmacy in Canada and they can wave around a Canadian pharmacy license. These are mostly members of an organization called the Canadian International uh, Pharmacy Association. And here's a list right here. So here is what Americans are supposed to believe. CanadianPharmacyMeds.com is one of these licensed Canadian internet pharmacies. And the message is, we're just like your local pharmacy. We're just like you. We're Canada. We're a little bit cooler. We've got Justin Trudeau. You know, I mean, he's got great hair, right? But we're just like you, this is just like your local pharmacy. So the marketing is, it's Canada. It's, it, who could oppose importation from Canada? It's just as safe as the US pharmacy. These are licensed pharmacies. We can show you our pharmacy. You criticize drug importation, you must be part of big pharma. And that's really the message that has been out there um, by the Canadian International Pharmacy Association and their advocates. The only reason you would oppose this is for revenue reasons, for, for your company. But we want, they say, Americans to get the same drugs Canadians get. Well, now, let's look at this and see if it's true. Now, the first example I want to give you as we start to untangle this is onlinecanadianpharmacy.com. Real Canadian pharmacy. You can walk into a brick-and-mortar pharmacy that they have. They can show you a Canadian pharmacy license. But let's say you get on a Canadian IP address. IP address is, that's where you're accessing the internet from. We have servers all around the world, so we can get on our servers in Canada and operate on the internet as if we're getting to this website from a Canadian province. You try to order a prescription drug and it says, sorry, at this time we don't ship to Canada. They never ship to Canada. Now wait a minute, why would a Canadian pharmacy not ship to Canadians? What's going on here? Likewise, candrug.com. They have a real Canadian pharmacy license, real Canadian pharmacist. But these drugs right here, Camagra, that's not an approved can uh, Canadian medication. You can't get this legally in Canada. It's only available in India. If you walked into a Canadian pharmacy, you couldn't get this. So what's going on here with these last two slides? So here's how it really works. If you're a Canadian resident and you order from a Canadian internet pharmacy like this, you get the drugs from the Canadian, uh, the Canada, the Canadian pharmacy shelves. You get the same thing as if you walked into a Canadian pharmacy. Let's say that as a US resident, you order the drugs from this licensed Canadian pharmacy. What happens? Well, only in a very small number of cases do you actually get the drugs from Canada. What they do is they take the order, they send it to someplace like Turkey, India, Singapore, a number of different countries, and you'll see some proof of this here in a minute with some of the documentation, and it goes to a cheaper place than Canada, and not a pharmacy in most cases. It's usually not a pharmacy, it's a warehouse, something like that. It's routed through someplace like the UK, Canada, someplace like that, that to Americans is going to seem like it's safe. It's going to seem like, oh, this is a safe country where I can trust the pharmacies. 
But in Turkey or someplace like that, they've slapped a label on it. So you're not getting the same drugs as a Canadian resident would, even though that's the marketing. It's coming from someplace else. Now let's look and see why we should care about that. So this is what we call a bifurcated supply chain. Canadadrugs.com, as background, currently under indictment here in the US for selling counterfeit drugs to their wholesale supply chain. But they're, uh, the seal isn't here, but they're one of these licensed Canadian pharmacies that is approved. Now, I, I want to go back to a case that happened, I think it was eight or nine years ago. It was a trademark case, okay? So this was not a drug safety case, but it's relevant for reasons I'll explain in a minute. These judges in the UK that were looking at this trademark case had to make certain findings about this UK pharmacy that was serving as a transshipment point. In other words, not a real supplier, but just where the drugs were routing through that were coming to the US when ordered by um, US residents uh, from a Canadian internet pharmacy, in this case, Canada Drugs. So here's what the judges found in their official findings. They said patients in the United States purchase and get prescription drugs in the following way. So to summarize this, they say, and this is copied from the judge's order, they order the goods from a Canadian company, CanadaDrugs.com, could be a different website. Uh, the prescription and the information is made available to the Canadian company. They then place an order with a Turkish company. The patient's name and address, all this HIPAA information, is supplied electronically. The Turkish company has stocks of the drugs. Now, in this case, it was genuine drugs. As we're going to see, there's a mix of genuine and counterfeit drugs that are in the supply chain. Then in Turkey, the dispensing label stuck on the product bears the words complete care pharmacy. And what's important to know here is that's the UK pharmacy. But this was happening at a Turkish warehouse in the Turkish free trade zone. You're not getting the same drugs as you'd get if you went into the UK pharmacy either. There are some people in the Canadian internet pharmacy world that don't believe that what they're doing is right. And because we're out there monitoring and we have all this data, they've shared some information with us. Here's an email from Eric Sigurdsson, who works for Canada Drugs, again, licensed Canadian pharmacy currently under indictment, to a supplier whose name I'm going to protect. He says, Eric, the above referenced order is destined to go to a Canadian address, and this is in one of the offshore locations, not Canada. Can I send the product? And Canada Drugs says, no, no, don't ship it. I'll take care of the order. Why? Because if it goes to Canada, you've got to send the real drugs from the Canadian pharmacy shelves. But that's the exception, not the rule. Normally, it's coming from another offshore location. They're currently under indictment uh, as for activity that occurred, I think it was in 2011 or 2012, some counterfeit cancer drugs. But as far back as 2007, as I'll show you, they knew that some of the drugs they were supplying were likely counterfeit. Here's a facsimile that they sent to their offshore Turkish supplier. Basically, what it says is that we're in a legal dispute. This is the... <laughs> By the way, here's what's interesting. Canada Drugs also has Canada Drugs Barbados, which is uh, like a subsidiary where the drugs funnel through in Barbados, right? So there is a dispute with the UK government about some uh, possibly counterfeit drugs going through the UK um, from Barbados to Turkey. I think actually that's supposed to be from Turkey to Barbados. Um, and they assert it's counterfeit. Canada Drugs hires an expert who says, the seized medicines appear to be suspect. In my opinion, it's a poor copy of a genuine medicine. This has not been disclosed. And this sort of thing is happening fairly regularly. Now, wouldn't the drug importation bill, let's play devil's advocate here, by placing the Canadian internet pharmacies under some sort of a regulatory scheme under US jurisdiction, wouldn't it take care of this problem? Wouldn't that actually be an improvement? Well, couldn't we just extradite anybody who, even if they're not in the US, did something bad like this. Well, this article just came out about three days ago. It's from the Canada Drugs Indictment. This guy was one of the ones, and he's over in Britain, who was supplying non-UK counterfeit cancer medications to the United States. And the long and short of it in this article is he's hired attorneys to fight um, extradition and say, I don't want to go face justice for the counterfeit drugs. So because it's extraterritorial, it's going to be really tough uh, under any sort of a drug importation bill to actually hold people accountable and provide that deterrence to doing things like this. Now, here's another example. This is the second of three. Jandrugs.com. They also are a real Canadian pharmacy, and if you walk into their pharmacy, you will get legitimate safe drugs. But what about if you order online? This is just to show that they actually have a physical location, Calgary, 
Well, here's their reshipment procedure. This is no longer online. They've taken this down. But this has been their reshipment procedure. And I'll just read a little bit of it and then zoom in. If caught by the FDA, that's never a good sign when you start off your policies that way. Verify that reshipment of the drugs is sent to the appropriate group. We don't see Canada on this list. We see Fiji. We see New Zealand, the UK, and Brazil. New Zealand and the UK are not actually the sources of any pharmacies. Those are transshipment points as well. India, Turkey, places like that. Here is a typical and a real customer complaint that was sent to Jan Drugs, a licensed Canadian pharmacy that sold online. It's from a, I'm protecting the patient identity here and, and their um, privacy, but I just wanted to share this as a US citizen. And the long and short of it is, he ordered Xenical from Jan Drugs and says, ultimately, it has absolutely no effectiveness. I know I can't do anything about it, but I'm just letting you know that the Xenical that was sent through Turkey is not Xenical. We get a lot of complaints like this. Last example, Universal Drug Store, also, again, common refrain, you can walk into a Canadian ph pharmacy. It's, it would be one of these pharmacies that would presumably be OK under the, uh, the new legislation. Well, here is an email from a foreign supplier, an offshore supplier. And there's a few things here I have to sort of untangle and, and explain. So this email is from this offshore supplier where he's saying, Dear Jeff, who helps run universaldrugstore.com, I don't think we've met or spoken before, but I understand you probably know about us through Dan Norman, who also runs this internet pharmacy, and maybe through Andrew Strempler. We recently shipped some uh, product to your facility in Malta on behalf of RX North. RX North no longer around, run by Andrew Strempler, who, in running RX North, went to prison for selling uh, counterfeit drugs to US residents. Purportedly, he was operating a Canadian internet pharmacy. Uh, one of the founding members of the Canadian International Pharmacy Association, he went to prison, obviously no longer uh, part of that. So this internet pharmacy writes back, this Canadian internet pharmacy, and says, yeah, we're, we're interested in this, but hey, I have a request. My wholesale location in Malta is very secret, and I want it to stay that way. Why would a drug wholesale location need to be secret? There's no good reason for it. And in fact, we have all of these packing lists in the airway bills from this location, the exporter, not a pharmacy in the Turkish free trade zone. That's just the way bill. So here's the marketing. Here's the public narrative. Certified Canadian internet pharmacies, which be, would be the ones subject to approval under this bill, have a 100% perfect safety record. That is simply false. For example, and this is not a complete list, in the last five years, you've got RX North, as I indicated, uh, they're, well, not the pharmacy, they're operated, went to prison for counterfeit drug sales. Probably the number one Canadian internet pharmacy um, for its wholesale supply chain, which is all the same and mixed in as the direct to patient supply chain. They're indicted, and they're fighting coming here to the US to be held accountable. Uh, the certification company that is widely used by the Canadian Internet Pharmacy Association, one of their directors was indicted for hiding counterfeit drugs in his garage. It was dismissed as part of a, a deal he made with DOJ to help them on some stuff. Um, and then you've got, just in the last couple of months, a, a number of other leading Canadian Internet pharmacies criminally charged for selling misbranded drugs not from Canada. And in numerous stages, some Canadian Internet pharmacies have been aware that some of their drugs are likely to be counterfeit, but haven't disclosed that. So why is this problematic? Actually, importation itself is not the problem. I don't have a particular feeling for or against importation per se. The problem is an unregulated supply chain. We have virtually no counterfeits in the United States because it's a closed supply chain. What various forms of importation do without giving the FDA the ability to actually continue to have it be a closed supply chain is to open it up to potential counterfeits. Is it 100% counterfeits? No, but the question, I think, from a policy perspective is, how many counterfeits are okay? 10%, 5%, 1%? Any one of those is far worse than we have today. And finally, even though the narrative is appealing, drugs from Canada. Look, if you walk into a Canadian pharmacy, it's safe, it's good, no problem with that. But the internet is a different story, 
And I'm not aware of any Canadian internet pharmacies that are actually sending most of their drugs from Canada. So that's why I'm here to share that intelligence with you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. I'll move this back. Thanks, John. So you've heard about why the internet is a problem when it comes to prescription drug importation to U.S. consumers. We want to also want to talk about the brick and mortar supply chain. This, is, this importation legislation um, reaches far beyond just what consumers do when they search. And so I'm pleased to um, invite Elizabeth Youngman from Pew Charitable Trust to talk more about her organization and their expertise in Drug Supply Chain Security Act. Thank you. Um, oh, is that Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll start by thanking Libby and Aesop for including me in this remarkable panel and uh, for partnering with Pew on this briefing. And thanks to all of you who've come and heard us out today. Uh, you know, I, I think regardless of which side of the importation debate you're on, we're really all here for the same reason. We all want patients to have access to safe drugs. So those of you who are, are in Congress have a, a challenge ahead of you. I mean, drug safety or drug, excuse me, drug pricing um, is a real problem. It's one that Pew is engaged in help trying to solve. Uh, but drug safety is also a real problem, and that's a place where Congress has recently made a lot of real progress. And so the struggle is, how do you resolve the drug pricing problem without undermining all of the progress that you just made on drug safety? So as Libby mentioned, I'm here, I'm going to shift us a little bit away from online pharmacy and really focus on the 2013 law, the um, Drug Supply Chain Security Act. I'll, I'll start with a brief overview of you know, how that law came to be, why that law came to be, what, what caused, us to, uh, to, caused uh, Congress to think about it. Um, I'll describe the law and then, then do a little bit of examining um, you know, what the impact will be if Congress introduces gaps in that law um, that, to, that allow a lot of drugs to come into the supply chain that don't adhere to its provisions. So the real take home here is that you know, it's important not to trade drug access for drug safety, that patients really deserve both. So let me see, I'm going to learn how to use this thing. There we go, okay. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but as, as some of you know, Pew has been working on uh, the drug supply chain and drug safety issues for many years. I'm gonna dive right into the content. So let's first start with the problem that we're trying to solve. We'll walk a little bit through this, this slide. This is a, a greatly simplified depiction of the pharmaceutical distribution system. So as you'll see, drugs travel from manufacturers to one or many wholesalers, to pharmacies, and ultimately to patients who dispense them, uh, or to pharmacies who dispense them to patients. Sometimes that flow, you'll see this kind of black line there, sometimes that flow goes the other way. So there are circumstances where either there is some sort of problem with the drug and it has to be recalled, or where there is unused product that needs to be returned, and so it'll, it'll kind of go back up the other way. Those returns have historically been a vulnerability in the supply chain. By returning, quote unquote, returning counterfeit or stolen product, you can introduce that, that product into the supply chain. And the red lines really illustrate here more of what can go wrong. So sometimes drug is stolen or diverted and then reintroduced into the system. That can happen either before it gets to patients or sometimes patients take drug and sell it back into the system. And, and in addition to that being you know, criminal activity, there are, as, as other panels have suggested, real effects here on patients. So you know, for a brick and mortar example, um, there was an example, a, a truck was stolen, a truck full of insulin was stolen. That insulin later appeared on pharmacy shel shelves in Texas and uh, apparently had not been held under proper conditions because patients who took the drug were unable to control blood sugar. So that kind of thing happens in the, in the brick and mortar world as well. Another risk here is counterfeit products. Um, this has been in the news a lot lately. Um, there have been a number of deaths, possibly including princes, when uh, patients who thought they were taking legitimate pain medication were ultimately taking illicitly ma manufactured fentanyl. Um, and, and, you know, just one particularly dramatic example, uh, some of you may have heard of this one. It's a, it's a little bit old, but still my favorite. Um, criminals cut an enormous hole in the roof of a warehouse rappelled down through that hole and loaded $76 million worth of drugs into trucks and took them away. And that number, I think, illustrates an important point. You know, we're all here today because drugs are expensive, but it's precisely because they're expensive that there is such an incentive to counterfeit them uh, and to introduce them into the supply chain. So fortunately, Congress recognized this risk and has taken action to secure our drug supply. The DSCSA was passed in November of 2013. I won't go deep into the political history here, but uh, suffice to say it was not easy. You had states who were grappling with how to protect their citizens, and at least two had passed meaningful legislation. 
Industry wanted a uniform national standard. They didn't want to have different laws apply or different rules apply each time product passed a, a new uh, state line. And drug safety advocates like Pew wanted to ensure that if you were going to preempt state law on this issue, that the national system uh, that was put into place was really meaningful and, and protected uh, against those vulnerabilities. And that's just the outside stakeholders, right? So as, as many of you in this room, and Kim, I'm looking at you, will remember there, were, there was a, almost two years of very intense negotiation on this bill here in the hill, on the Hill. So this slide, um, don't worry, we'll walk through it slowly. <laughs> so there's a lot here. But this really shows what Congress came up with. So starting here at the top of the slide in our cute little infographics here, um, those are the, what the, the law calls trading partners. Um, so these are the manufacturers, repackagers, wholesalers, and pharmacies that really make up the pharmaceutical supply chain. They each have obligations under the act. The timeline that shift, that, that's below that really shows you um, the two phases of, impl uh, of implementation of this law. So they're really kind of two, I, I would think about the law in terms of two phases. There's the time between now and 2023, that's sort of phase one, it's an implementation phase, um, where you're really scaling up to what will ultimately be phase two, which is a, a kind of full scale system. And that's the phase two is just the little black box uh, over there on the right hand corner. The, the black vertical line represents where we are now. And so, so what you see here is how we're increasing uh, requirements over time, scale us up to the system we're kind of going for in 2020. And along the left side of the slide, you see the basic requirements here. So there are product tracing obligations, and those were really what make it possible to track product as it moves through the supply chain. Serialization is what's going to allow that tracking to happen at the individual product level. And we're going to talk a little bit more about both product tracing and product serialization as we go. Um, but you should also know that the law requires each of the trading partners to identify suspect product, to quarantine that product, and to investigate it, and really, and to only allow it back into the supply chain once it's been determined to be legitimate. And some of these serialization tools will help them do that. And finally, the law addresses returns to close that loophole that we, we talked about a little bit earlier. We're just going to scratch the surface of the DSCSA today. Um, for those of you who know me know I'm always happy to talk about it more. Uh, <laughs> but the key point to remember here is that the, over time, the law is going to build to a system where information about drugs traveling through our supply chain is exchanged electronically and at the package level. This is not a system that Canada has, and it is not theoretical. Full implementation of this law is required by law, and the, it's beginning to already happen now. So this is not a, you know, we might get there. This is, a, this is already beginning to happen. So we are still at the beginning of this evolution. Um, and I'll, I'll describe the current tracking and tracing requirements in a moment. But I'd urge you to remember that this first phase of the law, the place we are now, was considered and rejected by Congress as the end point of the, uh, of the system. So as you look at importation proposals that apply the, the rules about tracing that apply now to imported drugs and use that to suggest that that's going to secure the safety of the drug supply, you should be aware that that is the proposal that Congress rejected four years ago. Congress would not have preempted state law in order to get us to a system that is no better than what we have right now. If this was as good as it was going to get, it would not have happened. It's also important to understand that the risks here are not just to patients who take drugs that are imported from Canada. The entire system doesn't work if we put big gaps into that system. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But first, let's talk about what we're doing right now. So we're in phase one right now. Trading partners exchange information about each transaction. So every time an entity buys or sells drugs products, they have to pass along transaction information. So manufacturer sells to wholesaler, wholesaler sells to pharmacy. They're passing along this transaction information. And that's basic information about the drug that's being sold and about the entity that is, is selling the product and the entity that is purchasing the product. In this first phase that we're in right now, they will also pass a transaction history. And that's basically a pedigree that lists the transaction information going back to the manufacturer. And what those documents do, those tracing documents do, is really help with investigations. So if there's a problem with the, the product, the pedigree can help trace up or down the supply chain to either figure out where illegitimate product was introduced into the system, or when we know we've got compromised product in the system, figure out where that product is and remove it. There are, however, some, some shortfalls to phase one. I mean, initially, this is going to all be done at the lot level. 
So we're going to know that a particular transaction involved drug from a specified lot of product, but we will not know exactly what drug is, is involved. And that level of generality is really not ideal. It means that if you're a pharmacist and you've got something wrong with a drug product, but you bought that product from multiple wholesalers, or that wholesaler bought it from multiple wholesalers, you're really not going to be able to identify where the problem was. Another issue here is that the transaction information itself can be counterfeited. And that's why the system eventually discards this pedigree in favor of an electronic system. Serialization is what's going to enable that transition to an electronic package level system. So starting this November, every package of drug product must contain a product identifier. And our little graphic there is trying to illustrate that. The identifier is a machine readable tag that contains a, a unique identifier for each package of drug product along with other basic information about the drug. So manufacturers will get those onto packages starting this November, and then over the coming years, the rest of the supply chain will come online to the system until everyone is dealing only in serialized product. There are immediate benefits to the serialization. It means that as soon as you've got product with that serial number on it, you're going to be able to, to take that, ping the manufacturer, and verify that this is actually product that came from that manufacturer. But serialization is also what makes it possible for us to shift to phase two. Phase two is the good stuff. Phase two is what made this law worth doing. By November 2023, we will have an electronic system able to detect exactly where in the supply chain every package of product is. That means that if there's a package there that shouldn't be, it will be relatively easy to flag. It means that if a company or FDA want to investigate suspect product, they can trace every package of product through the system. And if there's a recall, the manufacturer will be able to issue an alert that gets to exactly those pharmacies that bought that product. And so they will know that they've got compromised product on their shelves. This is a significant enhancement over the system that we have today. And industry is already heavily investing in getting us there. So let me shift a little bit to the, the topic that I think brings us all here today. Let's talk about importation. The success of this system hinges on its comprehensiveness. With the exception of certain you know, discrete product categories that are spelled out in the law, every unit flowing through the system will carry this traceable product identifier. So then we have to think about what happens if we've got pro imports coming in that don't bear that identifier. So first of all, those imported products won't conform with the DSCSA. Even if we say that companies have to pass transaction information and transaction histories, those histories aren't sufficient. They're not unit level, they will not allow for verification, and they will not allow those packages to participate in the electronic phase two system. And importantly, they can be counterfeited. Those companies that are sophisticated enough to counterfeit drug products can also counterfeit the documentation that goes along with them. But as I alluded to earlier, it doesn't just stop with the imported drugs. The system doesn't work. If, not, if a lot of drugs that are in the system are not part, or, or excuse me, a lot of drugs that are in the country are not part of that system. And I think we have to assume that it will be a lot of drugs. Like it, for, drug, for, for importation to work as a drug pricing policy, you want a large volume coming in so that you are lowering, lowering those prices. And the allure of the US market, uh, you know, I think will be substantial. And so, so I think we have to assume that we're not talking about a little bit of product coming over the border, but that if we open this up, we're really talking about a substantial volume here. And that means a, a, a substantial gap in the, in the security system, in what the DSCSA put together, is substantial enough that it could render both the law and all the work that's been done to, to implement it essentially meaningless. Because if there's a lot of imported product on the market, then if you are a wholesaler or you are a pharmacist and you receive a, a package of product that either has been flagged through the electronic system or is otherwise suspect, you no longer assume that that product is illegitimate. Now you think it's probably just Canadian and you pass it on. And we are back to the exact same problem that Congress set out to solve before the 2013 law. So I will just conclude with, you know, this takeaway, you know, we, we do need drugs to be affordable. Uh, but we also need them to be safe. And the DSCSA was a tremendous step forward. So as you consider how to solve the drug pricing problem, I would urge you not to throw out the remarkable progress that Congress has made in drug safety. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I'm going to close by just underlining the three points of failure that we've heard about today. 
As Congress thinks about accessing medicine from foreign sources, whether online or offline, you've heard about um, the problems of just the open market on the internet, right? So Congress is thinking about sending people to a list of safe sites. How many of you have ever gone to a government list for anything? How many of you have gone to HHS's website in the past 10 years? Did you even know HHS had a website? So if Congress wants to send you to a safe list of licensed Canadian pharmacies, good luck finding it. That's the problem one. And when you do a search, as John showed you, you'll see websites, legal online pharmacy, that will sell you opioids without a prescription shipped to your door. That's the first problem. Problem number two, if you are so lucky to find the HHS list of certified Canadian licensed pharmacies, good luck getting a Health Canada approved medicine from them. As John Horton showed you, that's like finding a needle in a haystack. Problem number three, if you try to go the brick and mortar supply chain, you say, oh, the internet is dangerous as, as just evidence, so I'm gonna go to my brick and mortar down the street. You might get a product that is actually suspect, but we just blew a hole in the Drug Quality Supply Chain Security Act, and so that pharmacist doesn't know that it's a suspect product and passes it on to you, throwing, throwing a wrench in the entire drug safety system that Elizabeth so nicely just shared with us. Three points of failure, search, lists, brick and mortar under importation. It's just not worth the risk. So with that, we look forward to answering your questions and hope to be able to provide a whole bunch more information. We have letters from two Canadian provincial boards of pharmacy that have weighed in on, the, on this issue. So if you want to know what Canada thinks, Canada regulators have spoken up in April as well. If you want to know what uh, former FDA commissioners think, four former FDA commissioners have spoken up in March. If you want to know what boards of pharmacy, the pharmacy regulators in the US states think, States of Boards of Pharmacy also have letters out on the table. And also all of our letters, as well as our allies, the pharmacists and uh, provider groups as well, also have shared their views with Congress. And we have a package of those ready and waiting for you. We continue to update this information on our website, buysaferx.pharmacy. So for the latest information, news, op-eds, facts, um, reports that come out, we will be providing that information on buysaferx.pharmacy. And we hope to be working with you as you continue, continue to find ways to create access to safe, affordable medicine for U.S. consumers. Thank you.